What's up, Detroit? How you guys doing? This is that guy, Rel, the host of the 313 Live Show, Detroit's Russ Podcast. People, I be riding around Detroit in my new Cadillac DTS, and everybody be like, yo, Rel, where did you get that clean Cadillac at? I tell them, DCC used auto sales right there at 3130 East 8 Mile Road. They sat right on the corner of East 8 Mile and Cherries. All you got to do is you go in there, say, yo, I was listening to the 313 Live Show, and that guy, Rel, told us to come up here and you got a vehicle for us. And they're gonna put you in the vehicle. And matter of fact, when you get there and say you heard this commercial on the 313 Live show, whip out your phone and call me at 313-293-8855. And you say, I got that guy real on the phone right now. And when they put me on the phone with you guys, guess what? I'm gonna say, give them that $500 off any vehicle that they want. And they're gonna do that. And they got a limited amount of vehicles that you're going to put only $699 down. That's right. $699 down on a limited amount of vehicles. But all vehicles are going to get the $500 discount for coming in and saying, yo, I heard this commercial on the 313 Live show. Detroit City on the runway. You ready? ready? What up, dog? What up, dog? Oh my God! Three one three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Three one three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Oh my God! Three one three live. Yo, what's up, podcast world? How you guys doing? This is that guy, Rel, the host of the 313 Live show. Episode 93, that's what we doing right now. And we got my homie, Mo ZMD. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Mo ZMD. He's in this motherfucker with us, y'all. And we chop it up. We talk about Tupac. Talk about um a lot of stuff with the little half-dead situation. We're not here to diss nobody. we just bringing the real to the people. And letting the people, you know, hear what Mo had to say in his own words. This is one of those interviews, ladies and gentlemen, that you don't want to fast forward through. You want to listen to it in its entirety. Because you're going to hear some shit, some jewels that you ain't heard before. So stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, because we coming up with the interview right after this commercial break. Hey, everyone, it's your homegirl, Danny Ass. And if you can't get enough of me on the 313 Live Show, then I suggest you come over to Something to Brag About podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Just keyword search STBA. You can also find us on social media, IG and Facebook at Something to Brag About podcast. Please come and check us out. We'd love to have you. Yep, that's right. Because if you like me over here, you're going to love me over there. Thank you and good night. Yo, yo, ladies and gentlemen, what's up, people? This is that guy, Rel. Y'all already know that, and I'm back. Nah, I got a special guest on the phone with us, and um, we here to chop up some shit. And, you know, um, this is surprising. I'm going to let this guy introduce himself. And tell y'all who he is. Go ahead and tell the family who you are, my brother. Mosey! <laughs> Mosey! Life ain't never been easy. Living in the ghetto. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> now, Mo, check this out, Mo. Now, listen, baby. This is the 313 Live Show, man. We raw over here. You know, we, we don't dance around the questions. We get straight to the shit. We go straight into it. We, we, we cut all that old fuck shit out and get straight to the point. Now, the first question I want to ask you, right, because, you know, some people hit me up, you know, and say, yo, there's this um, YouTuber going around and he's saying that I'm Mo E. Oh, no, Mo is the guy who produced Brenda's Got a Baby. Is that true? Did you produce Brenda had a, Got a Baby? No, I did not produce Brenda's Got a Baby. <clears throat> okay. Now, I knew that personally, but I just, you know, you know, I wanted you to personally say that out of your own mouth so that the people can hear it, brother. So, um, 
Okay. Now let's 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 yeah. cut let, let's cut the shit, right? Let's go straight let's go straight into it, man. You know I gotta go straight into it. Now, I fucks with Jesse, J Mix, I fucks with RJ Bun. I fuck with them, they're my people, they cool. But you know, I'm my own man. They they own men. They don't agree with some shit that I say and do, and I, I don't agree with some shit they say and do, right? But you know, we mm-hmm. we still, you know, we chop it up. There's no beef or nothing like that. But when they brought the little half dead theory to me, right, of saying little half dead was responsible for Tupac's death, and little half dead claimed that Tupac stole Brenda's got a baby, the song, right. and the jailhouse snitch ladder, right? I right. couldn't touch that. Because, you know, it just, to me, it didn't add up, and I couldn't fuck with that, you know. I'm like, yo, you know, I, I can't fuck with that, child. I can't touch that. It, it didn't make sense to me because as a street cat, I come out the street, and niggas every day in jail will lie on the motherfucker just to tell the people what they want to hear so they can get a lighter sentence. I didn't fuck with it. Now, when you was hearing this bullshit about half dead, set Pac up, and got Pac killed to kill Pac, you know, how did that shit make you feel? When I, when I first heard it, I, I, I was going through YouTube and I was just checking out different documentaries and everything. Then I saw that because I was watching the, the ones about who killed Park and, and the different theories and stuff. And then I saw a little hand there and I was like, is this fake? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, um, hmm. This is weird. So I, 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 I saw it and I, I read through it and I, kind of laughed about it at first. I, I uh, thought it was such a ridiculous thing, especially because of the the motive of, of him stealing the song, Brenda's Got a Baby, from uh, from Half Dead. Like, he stole it from Half Dead, and then Half Dead is mad after all these years. And I know Half Dead since I was a kid. Like, his whole family, Nate Dogg, Snoop, all those guys, I, I've known them since childhood. I, I knew what they were doing around the time Brenda's Got a Baby had come out, and n- none of them were in the business at the time. They were still on the street. Snoop was making little street records or whatnot with DJ Slice and at VIP Records and everything. And, uh, you know, Little Half there was really just, you know, he was on the street. He was banging. He was, you know... He was doing what he's doing. He wasn't thinking about rapping. Mm-hmm. His whole family, you know, and at the time, even Nate Dogg was rapping. He wasn't singing. He was rapping. And so for uh, for him to have come up with that and somehow run into Tupac and Tupac can hear it and go, oh, I like that. I'm going to take that. First of all, that's not even Tupac's character to take somebody else's song when he just knocks out songs back to back to back to back and there's many people who have seen him do it i've witnessed him do it many times he'll knock out a song and it'd be like it's the like you like he how long did it take you to write that you know stuff that people would take days to write he will write in a, a matter of you know an hour or so but he's gonna take this from little half dead who at the time was not even in the industry and had no hadn't done any songs and had no connection with him being able to hear that, um, it was ridiculous. Half Dead made his first record in 94, and it was after Snoop Dogg said on the song, I'm in the cell with my little homie Half Dead. Mm-hmm. So Half Dead that took that and went and got a deal with it and parlayed it and, you know, got together with some people and, and did some tracks and, you know, some people helped him write some stuff. He didn't really, you know, he wasn't. He was, he was learning what he was doing at that time. He had help. And so for for me to know that and to think that he had written a song like Brenda's Got a Baby when all the, all his other songs are like gangster songs and, and none of them have that kind of concept of like, okay, I'm going to teach the youth or I'm going to tell this beautiful story about, you know, a poetic, uh, tell a story in a poetic way. You know, his stuff was, you know, bitch, and nigga, and you nigga this, and son, <laughs> and what, you know, money, cuss, you know, and that's his vibe, and that's the records that we did. I tried to stretch him even more and do a little bit more with, you know, like he did with Southern Girl, and, you know, like try to make songs and stuff, and uh, even at that, even those songs weren't like Brenda's Got a Baby, 
they weren't like power struggles, songs that make you tear up and that kind of thing. It was just far fetched. So why? Uh, so then here again, why would he kill him? For what? Then I hear this other theory about him and Snoop supposedly beefing, and and Little Head did it, is, is Snoop's number one shooter or something. Yeah. And I'm like, no, man, no. Fancy ain't gonna run around shooting people <laughs> just because of this and that. He, he don't. He, he don't have. I don't even think he has one case that he has been to jail for for shooting somebody. If it is, I don't know about it. I, I've not known him to, to do that and be like the number one shooter and run around and handling business for Snoop like that. They do they do music. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and to, to take someone that they both admire and say, okay, I'm going to take his life and neither one have a good reason to do it, it just blows all, the, all those theories out the water. It makes no sense. Not at all. You know, like I say, it was a it was a dangerous situation to even put that out there. And um, like I said, this this man has kids, he has family, yeah. and you know, like I said, it's, it's a lot of thank God that we are in America, and a lot of people in America have common sense to say, well, no, nah, that just don't sound right. But you got these right. you got these guys overseas. You know, not now. Let's let me clear this up, cause I don't want to, you know, up offend my my family. You know what I'm saying? Because um, my family, I got a lot of family overseas, but a lot of these guys overseas are young white boys, young white kids, teenagers, and they want to be a part of the black culture so bad, and they want to mm-hmm. embrace it. So anybody can tell them. I just saw Tupac. At the um, Starbucks in New York, and they gonna believe that shit, or they can say, "Well, right. I, I just saw Tupac over in Africa," and they gonna right. believe that shit because they're gonna take it and run because they don't know any better. They don't know our fucking culture. Right. And and, and the people right. and there's a lot of people not only on podcasts but are mainly on YouTube and they're taking this shit and spinning it and telling these people shit that they want to hear to get clicks. To get views, to get right. likes, and this shit is dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Like dangerous. I said, people, some people like to be lied to, mm. and they don't know any other way or any better, or what, they don't respect you unless you lie right. to them. Unless you lie. Right. Because a lie sounds better than the truth any day to some people. Most like of them. Like a movie, like, you know, they like the drama. Most definitely, brother. So, um, like I said, I'm glad that nothing happened to Lil Half Dead or, you know, Lil Half Dead didn't have to kill nobody or something like that for running up on him with some bullshit. And I'm happy that that didn't happen. Right. But now we, we answered right. we, we answered that. We got all that, to, you know, together. Said what we need to say. Let, let's move on to you, my brother. Now, how did you first hook up with Tupac and, and, and how did you guys meet? To start work, I was uh, I was working with uh, another guy from Long Beach named uh, Radio, mm-hmm. and he was uh, signed to Interscope. He was actually the first uh, hip hop artist signed to Interscope. Uh, they had like the uh, I think it was like I don't know if it was the California Raisins or something of that nature. Like it was like a cartoon kind of deal, mm-hmm. and uh, they got this guy Radio who really influenced and helped Snoop and Domino both be like, you know, in, in, in developing their rap rap styles and, and the things that they do kind of came from radio. Even myself, he influenced a whole lot of people from Long Beach, but he was signed with Interscope and uh, one of my mentors, Keith Clark, was producing him at the time and they were having him change his program up because he was doing like gangster rap but they were unsure about it. So they had me flip it to some heavy D kind of stuff. So I was working on that for a while. This this was like what Tupac was doing, all that Brennan's Got a Baby and all that stuff. Uh, he had came in a little bit around the time when I did, working on radio. We were doing that, and then, of course, Snoop blew up with the gangster rap, so they went to radio and was like, hey, flip it back to the gangster stuff. And so we started doing gangster stuff again. And Tupac happened to be in John McClain's office and heard 
some stuff I did for radio. I was like, ooh, who was that on the track? And uh, he told him who I was, and he said, um, i like to work with him. You know, I want to get with him. They called me up and, and told me that, you know, put together some tracks to send to him, and he got some remixes mm -hmm. that he wanted me to come to the studio to uh, work on to see what I could do. So I put together some tracks and put them on a cassette and sent it to them to, to send to him. And meanwhile, that night I went to the studio and worked on remixes for uh, Pray Up to the Grave, Running for the Police, and uh, Lord Knows. And so after doing that, uh, Tupac heard that and loved it so much that it flew me to New York the next week to work with him in uh, a quad studio. So I went in the quad studio and set up and everything, and then he comes in, and he's like, Mosey, standing in there looking like Dr. Drake. And I said, I don't look like Dr. Drake. And he was like, well, man, what's up, man? I love your music. And, and you know, just on and on and on, and, and introduced me to the outlaws, who at the time they was called uh, Young Niggas, I believe. Drum, uh, the drum recital? Uh, or they it was before they was drum recital. Okay. Because they were going to, I think it was going to be Young Niggas. And uh, we started working on Outlaw because uh, he went through the, the cassette that I sent him and found one of the ones that I had done that I didn't intend to put on there because it was an R&B track. And, and he, uh, when we finally found it, and, and he said, yeah, this is the one, this is the one. And I said, oh, man, I didn't mean to put that on there. This is a R&B track. And he said, well, it's a rap now, nigga. <laughs> oh, all right. Mm -hmm. And that turned, into, that turned out to be Outlaw. Mm -hmm. And right then, he's telling me, this weekend, we're going to drop Cradle to the Grave on the radio. And instead of using the regular version on the album, we're going to put your version on the album. And I'm like, whoa. So in a week's time, I went from chilling at the crib to being on the radio and in the studio with two pockets. It was bananas. Now, that's what's up. Now, now let me ask you a question, because you, you brought up the song Outlaw. Who was the yeah. little young dude, Lil Ra Ra? Who was that guy? Ra Ra was a dude that Pac knew from the neighborhood out there, or he met, or, you know, he just somebody was around. And even the guy that, that said, the game ain't the same, and doing like the little roster, mm -hmm. he picked him up the same day and brought him to the studio. And he was just like trying to figure out something for them to do. Mm -hmm. And and he thought about, I really want to put that uh, that thing that Snoop said, uh, dear God, I want to know, could you save me? And he said, I, I want the little guy to say that. I want you to say that. He couldn't get him to say it on time. So he had to say it with him. Mm -hmm. So that's why you hear both together saying, Dear God, I wonder could you say me. Yeah. And then and the other guy he said, I want you to come in here, I want you to say, The game made this same. And so he did that. And then we let him do like a three and a half minute, three, four minute roster, which you know, I thought he was about to do some like you know, like just chatting it up. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of it was kind of amateurish a little bit, you know, like he didn't really know what he was doing. He had really never been in the studio before. Right. So the, because of that, and the song was like seven minutes long, Pac was like, I don't know if I'm going to put this on the album. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me go back and do an edited version. So we went back and edited his roster stuff out, the part, and took it to the right to the end where he said, things changed. 1995, the game's changed. Like the real shape, the rules already ready. You know, and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. But yeah, this cat, this picked up. Wow. So that's deep. So Pac was really into influencing cats to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to bring you in the studio with me. You know what I'm saying? And maybe this right here would just, you know, those two guys that he just picked up and bought in the studio forever are known because they are attached to Tupac just off of that song. Forever. And, right. that, and that little guy, Ra Ra, he's about, he's in his 20s, like late, like mid to late, not in his mid 20s right now. So that's that's a, a big look for him, something great for him to say, wow, this is me as a kid on Tupac's album. You know what I'm saying? He got that to share with his kids and grandkids. And, and all of that is because of Tupac. See, people, this is what yeah. I'm saying. Go, go ahead. He can say, Mom tried to sue the producer, too. Wow. <laughs> Mom tried to sue 
his mom tried to sue me because she was like, you know, he was too young and he didn't have no contract and then like that and he's associated with Tupac and I was like, I didn't bring him to the studio. That was that's what Pac wanted to do. And right. Yeah, I, I should have as the producer, I should have been like more, you know, getting everybody paperwork and doing all that kind of stuff. But man, I was in the studio with Tupac. I didn't know what I barely could you know. Hell of my excitement. <laughs> right. So Ra Ra's mama tried to sue you. Yeah. Wow. How did that work out? My lawyer, I had a really good lawyer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she said, don't even worry about it. Because okay. at the time, I was on tour with John Mellencamp, and she was like, hitting me up like, oh, my God, the little boy's mom trying to sue you. Wow. But I got in. Yeah, she took care of it. That's deep. Now, when Pac first, when, when Pac started working on, um, me against the world was he he started working on this before he was shot at quad city or after it was before he got shot okay. it was actually some it was simultaneous with thug life he had been working on me against the world and he was on something else uh he was, he was going to call it f the world at one point but it was going to be something else uh before that and um i came when i came along and did Prayer to the grave, and Lord knows, and run for the police. I didn't like. I don't know if they knew where where the songs were going because he was just recording so fast and doing so many things that when I was working on the songs on Me Against the World, he was um, still doing like clean versions for the songs for Thug Life. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we were doing simultaneous sessions, and even at the same time, he was doing makeup. Like they were doing some kind of makeup for that movie. He did. Uh, he had the scar on his face. Above the rim. I can't think it was. Above the rim. After that, it was after that. Oh, okay. Um, the one with Mickey Rourke. I know what you're talking about. When, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that was yeah. Bullet, yeah. Bullet or something like that. Yeah, I think it was Bullet. Yeah. Because we were in two different studios doing the clean version to Cradle to the Grave for the video shoot, and then at the same time in a different studio doing. Uh, I believe it was some extra stuff on Throw Your Hands Up, I believe. I mean, it was just mad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So <laughs> now, now off of Me Against the World, how many how many tracks you worked on? That were, those were your tracks, but other than Outlaw and um, um, run, no, Running From the Police wasn't on that album. How many, track, no. how many tracks you got on there? I got Outlaw. Young niggas and part of Lord knows, right? Because okay. I did a, it's like they got the main producer Brian G, mm-hmm. and um, I did a remix, and Tony Cazaro did a remix, and they combined all three of the mixes together to, to make that version. That's how that happened. Like we weren't in the studio together, but it, you know, they had the uh, the YMV girls singing the Lord knows, Lord knows, yeah. Lord knows. And Tupac was telling me to take them off of that. And so I put my sister, my cousin Kenyatta, and G-Money on it. And they were doing ad-libs and such. And then there was a part that was already on the tape that had this guy going, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I kind of left that in my mix on part. And they took that out, and they took the ad libs out, and they put the YMV girls back in with my sister and G Money and my cousin, and and then they put uh, the the lead singer the, Natasha put her uh, ad libs back in. <clears throat> so I, I didn't even hear how that turned out until the record came out. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was all, all good because hey those are, that's a classic album man that's a straight classic so you to know. me it was a really a good a good uh collaboratory because we we had all these really great producers on there and that, and on top of it we had a guy who was a great producer himself jimmy Irvine. Mm-hmm. You know, checking stuff out and, and, and Tom Wally and you know, it was like a team of people, a team of engineers, Paul Arnold and and Jay Lean and uh I mean like all these cats that, that really was on top of their game and putting it together and, and like the producers would do stuff and then sometimes the engineers would go in and do stuff 
that that they would tell them to do. And you know, it was like a well oiled machine, just bananas. Wow. But there is a song on there that I had an idea for. My my engineer was mixing it, Paul Arnold. Mm-hmm. And it was if I died tonight. Yeah. He was mixing it. He was, if I die tonight, it's tonight, tonight is tonight. And then I said, Tonight, tonight I get in some shit. And then he was like, Ooh, that might be dope. I said, Man, it's just a sample of that. Get Dr. Dre's sample, put that in there. And he put that in there. So that was my idea. Mm-hmm. You know, and and we was doing all that kind of stuff. We was like mingling with each other, man. It was cool. Wow, that, that's a that's beautiful, man. Like now, when you was working with Pac, like okay, we we hear our st- you know everybody's stories on, on Tupac, right? Your experience yeah. in the studio with Tupac. I mean, what was Tupac like as the man, the artist, just that guy? What was he like dealing with? He was like a, a ball of energy, waiting for the word to go. Mm-hmm. He was like we. If we start a track, because there were some, like, three hands that we started from zero, you know, he wanted to use that, uh, that, uh, Robert, uh, that one Ice Cube and, uh, Yo Yo did together. Right. That Bunny and Pete thing. So, uh, I took that to start working it. And by the time I, you know, was halfway through the track, you know, he's smoking and he's dancing around, he's writing, singing it to himself, and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he's like, oh man, you ready, Moses? You ready? And I'm like, almost, almost got a latest, we got a latest hi hat. We got, you know, because I'm laying stuff in pieces. You know, we didn't have the same kind of luxury where, you know, you could just do it and then copy it down. You know, you have to listen to the hi hat for 35 minutes to first to EQ it and then to lay it down. You know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So he was like, just ready to go. And then soon, as soon as you say go, he boom. And the thing that I loved about him the most is once he got in the booth. He didn't just, it wasn't like an ego thing. He he listened to, to what I had to say. If I told him, your ad-libs was a little bit off, like, uh, can we punch in here and, like, try to say it, like, you know, you want to be like a mirror image. You you know, I'm explaining it to him, and he's really taking notes and listening to what I'm saying to do. I felt like that made our records better because, you know, he, when the artist and the producer can can get together and communicate that vibe together you you can create anything and make it the best because you, you both are open to each other's ideas and how to make the best project you know wow. okay i so think that, it, that was the best thing to me and it was just fast i worked fast he worked fast we could easily do three songs in a 12-hour session you know from zero to finish and that's what me doing my crazy full production, you know, not just having simple beats, but just like going nuts on it. That's that's and dope. All the background. <laughs> now, now, was Pac the type of guy that you would have to like do a bunch of takes on, or he'd go in there and nail that shit on one or two takes? His lead track was usually a one taker, and his ad lib track, uh, the the second one, usually we would do a little work on it just to try to really mirror and make it. Right. And then when he does like an ad lib track, I just let him roam free and, and feel free, you know. And he just he get that in one take as well. That so that lead take is one take. <laughs> oh yeah, because he he just knew what he wanted to say and how it, you know even if it switch up from being calm to like you know how he amp up and you know. You know and get it like that. You know it's just right. like he he knew how to emphasize it and and my job was just to help help the rest of the guys in the background fit in with what that lead is doing and not take over because i had heard on a couple records that he had done where the ad libs wasn't it wasn't quite lined up with it and for me it kind of messed it up you know I, i'm I, when i listen to records i'll be like critiquing them i don't really get to enjoy records unless right. it's something that it's so creative that, that it just grabs me. There have been records over the years that just grabbed me like that. And I Get Around was one of them, where it was like the production on it was just so bananas. And the, the way that he did everything on it was bananas. So I, I, that's one of the ones that really made me cling to him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had homies who was loving, like, how did you hear me? And all that stuff. And, and you know, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. I, I couldn't get past the production. Um, 
aspect of it, and not necessarily the tracks, you know, but because I admire a lot of those tracks, was, you know, was really dope, but there were just details that I guess I was pulling from different genres of music that I wanted to apply to hip hop to give it a little more clarity and, you know, and, and it had a good feel to it because it, it reminded me of that Chuck D, you know, and Ice Cube's first solo album, that kind of, you know, dirty loops and, you know, that kind of feel. Even some of those records, I was feeling like, oh my gosh, if the mix was just a little, you know, I'm just, I don't know. <laughs> just, For sure. It is like that. <laughs> Man, hey, I know I speak to a lot of producers that say that they they can't enjoy music because <laughs> they always listening to it and well, this should have been this or that should have been that. So wow, hey y'all, yeah. it, see us, we ain't got those ears, but you guys, y'all got them, and that's a that's a gift and a blessing from the man above. Now let, let me ask yeah. you this: Did you ever meet Biggie? Did you ever? No, knowing personally or meeting. I never got to meet Biggie, man. I got to meet Puffy um, because uh, my other engineer, uh, Conley Abrams, had worked with Puffy on some stuff, and I was in the studio. Actually, this was a a, a, a song of Tupac as well that I, that me and Conley was working on, but Pac wasn't there. It was a mix or something. I can't remember what it was exactly, but but he said, "Hey, Puff is in the next room. You want to go meet him?" I'm like, "All right, cool." And we go over there, and he's on the phone. He got one phone on the ear, and the other phone he got down, like on hold. And he had a whole bunch of stuff going on. And he just looked up, and he was like, "Hey, how's it going, man?" And I said, "Hey, good, good, bro." You know, that was it. Didn't really get a chance to chop it up with him either. But I was fans of both of them too, man. I was, I was wigging out that I was working on a record that Pac and Big was doing together. Right. Because it was. You know, I admired the, the grit and the stuff that he, you know, I, I was a fan of East Coast records more so than I was of West Coast records just because of the, the feel. It just felt different. It felt more alive and, and it felt more energy. And California records, you know, West Coast records had a different energy, which at times to me had its plus. But it wasn't something I wanted to listen to on the regular. I was like a real bubbly person. You know, I, I like to be like dancing around and, and get up and jump, and jump around, jump around, you mm -hmm. know, and maybe move and stuff. And then it was like, there was songs, you know, like, uh, today was a good day. And it was like, okay, that's cool. You know, I love that song, you know, and I was just, it just didn't give me the same kind of energy. So I was more of a, uh, most of my favorite rappers were from the East Coast, like uh, Rakim, uh, KRS One. Uh, Busta Rhymes, uh, my West Coast favorite rappers, DOC and RBX. Right. So it's like, and I didn't even know I was a fan of RBX, and didn't even realize that I went to school with RBX. We had a locker right next, right next to each other the whole time I was in high school. <laughs> and then when I saw one of the people, oh, that's what I do. That's RBX. But I was a fan of his. And then to find out all those years later that RBX and DOC was writing, Snoop and them stuff. I'm not them stuff, but Snoop stuff, mainly Snoop and Dre. I was like, whoa, that was heavy to me. That was like two of my favorites. Right. But I was more of an East Coast fan because, of, you know, they were more animated. Boom, stick it, boom, stick it, boom, rock, 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 rock. I don't know. I was just, I was just a fan of it. Just nuts. For, hey man, that, that's um like I said, that was when music was music. I'll be the first to say it. I always say it. I don't give a fuck who don't like it, but this shit today, a lot of this shit is garbage. I don't listen to it. I'm listening to the old school shit from back in our era, you know. So that's what I'm, I'm on. Is very rare. You know, that, hmm, go ahead. There, there are some people that that do this music today in the trap or, or whatever the style they do that get music and are able to interpret music through the, the different style that they're doing. But there's some people who do this trap and all these other different kinds of music that don't really know music. They know how to get some fly sounds, how to put them in and out here and there. That's why you hear a lot of tracks where the drums drop out so much you you don't 
you, you hear like a lot of little meandering around with the keys. And it's a flavor to that, but if if your formula is that every time and it's just like little notes here and there and it's not really anything that's going to, I don't know, there's no chords, there's no change, there's no movement as far as like coherency, music, musicianship-wise. You can't get a band to play it is what I'm saying. Right. You know, there's some people that are able to take songs that with that flavor and then they can make a band play it because they know how to okay it's going to be keyboards here and then there's going to be another keyboard playing this part and another keyboard playing this part but it's going to go together and it, you know they know how to put it together but a, a lot of music that you hear on the radio is centered around people who don't know how to handle their business and they got labels that know how to get what they want out of them, put them in situations where they can uh, optimize their visibility to make them team. And more people hear that music than hear the authentic creative, not that that's not creative, but authentic uh, musicianship from other people who are valid. Like, you know, just because it's not that style don't mean it's not a valid thing. Right. All the different styles are valid. There are people who still love rock and roll. Back to like the you know, the fifties. There I I go by their house and they listen to rock and roll. You like wow. And there's an audience for everything. It's just the radio is geared towards those other people because they know that they can get their money and and everybody's following them thinking, Oh, they're out there getting their money and then they find out five or six years later Oh, somebody was taking their money. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> nah, <laughs> shit crazy. Nah. Like, you, like, before you say that, somebody was hitting me the other day and was like, you know, um, like Cardi B, man, she come out of nowhere. She just blew up and she making her money. She making her change. And I'm going, okay, okay. She may be getting some advances here and there and here and there, doing this and that, that get some revenue, but she ain't rich yet. She ain't getting her money money. Thank you. And if you there's some people who, who like, oh yeah, you know what? I think she still like lives in an apartment. Well, yeah, she she's gonna do that for probably a year. And she's gonna be a workhorse but she's gonna get enough endorsements and she's gonna get enough situations that people are gonna get her into that she can sustain for a while and then get a big mansion and then the record business will take over and go, Okay, now you owe us all this money because we funded you all this money, and you and then you're like, uh oh, how did uh how did Nicki Minaj be able to sustain that? Oh, you know? mm -hmm. and they got they got different kind of things going on. Little Wayne is making sure that his artists are are eating and doing stuff and not screwing them over. That's the way it should be done. That's what to me. Now I don't know personally their business and how they handle it, but I I see Nicki Minaj and I see Drake still with Lil Wayne and they still doing records and it's been some quite some time and you know what I'm saying if somebody was getting screwed over they would have been like I'm off doing my own thing right they all got the juice mm -hmm. but you see all these other people who come out and they blow up for a second and then people are like oh yeah yeah like Gundam, Gundam style Gundam style people, they, he thought he was going to come back with another single <laughs> man like, shit, for real. shit is crazy <laughs> Yeah. world right there he should have went into acting after that true you that know? like I, like i said i i look at i, I I'm, I'm i'm we friends on facebook and i seen one day you had posted up a post you asked a good ass question and i knew i knew the answer to it when you was like okay you was gonna give somebody a copy of of your new album a project you got coming out right email it to them mm -hmm. if they could tell you the to get to give you the right answer to the question that you was going to ask them like which video did Tupac and Dr. Dre first appear in together and I'm like oh that's easy that was natural born killers come on now and he was like wrong I'm like what get the fuck out of here is, is he for real I'm wrong no nah. it was natural born killers and then you, you hit it off like no same song it was same song I'm like yeah. damn I, had, I thought that until that moment 
that I had put that up, I, I went, I was on Instagram, and somebody had posted up that video, like a little clip of that video, when I called around, went and hang around, and it went all the way through that chorus, and I was like, that goes Dre in them. I said, I got a, I got a question for them. Oh, this would be dope, because I really thought it was Natural Born Killers myself. Mm-hmm. Wow. So speak, speaking of Dr. Dre, man, did you ever meet Dr. Dre and work with Dr. Dre? Yeah, but, well, I didn't get a chance to work with Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre was more of a mentor to me. Like, I, I met him through uh, a friend of mine named, well, actually, it was a, it was a group called Times Three, and um, I was working with them. They were out of Carson, and eventually they ended up being the girls going, Snoop Dogg, get yeah, And yeah. so, but this was before that, and she knew Dre, and Michael Collier, the comedian, was getting married, and she was like, they're having a reception, and NWA is going to be there, and, and I'm going to bring you there to meet them. I'm like, cool. So me and my boys, we, you know, we were a production team at the time, and took us up there to meet them, and I met Dre, and I met Ren, and I met Easy, and I met L.A. Dre, and I met DJ Speed, and DJ Scratch. Mm -hmm. And so this was in uh, 88, and so after that, Dre and I kept in touch and, uh, you know, just talking music and he picked me up. We'd ride around in the car listening to stuff he liked. He liked that, he was, at the time, he liked that special ed. That do, 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 mm -hmm. do, 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 do. He was like, yeah, listen to that production. You know, we talked about, oh, yeah, how you get that snare like that? How you do this and that? And so he took me to the studio room one day and they was recording uh, Easy E's part on All in the Same Game. Mm -hmm. So I got to, hung, to hang out there and watch them record that, and I'm just like, wow, watching how he, you know, had, he said, I, I did this, and I punched it in here and did that, and had all the punch ins already on tape, and I'm just like, wow. And, you know, we just, we did that for, I don't know, maybe a year. I just kept hanging with him, talking to him, and he would come to, my dad was doing these shows in Hollywood uh, for my, our label, we started Funk House. And so we were doing these shows and bringing these amateur artists to be, in, to perform in front of like A&Rs and stuff from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so Dre would come and he would watch and, and we would have like Ricky Harris was on the show and Jamie Foxx. And before he got famous, and Yvette Wilson before she got famous, and Speedy before he got famous, they would do comedy stuff, and and Jamie would do his little singing, and you know, kill everybody who was trying. I'm trying to see my baby face, and he come in there doing a stand up act, killing everybody. And uh, you know, it just Dre and Shook came to a couple of them. I think Snoop and some of them guys came, you know, because a lot of Long Beach artists and some Compton artists. And a few people got deals off of that. And I actually, because of hanging with Dre, I, it altered my name. I was going by Mosey Star. And I was like, man, I want to be a doctor, man. I want to, you know, like Dr. Dre, man. And he was like, well, man, Mosey MD. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> I think I'm going to lose that dog. I'm going to roll with that. Mosey MD. And from that moment on, it was it. Was it. Word. Now, you said that you was in the studio with Dre now when they was recording Easy's part for All in the Same Gang. How many yeah. how many takes did it take Easy to do that song? Ooh, it was a lot. <laughs> in fact, I left before he finished. Dre kept calling him. He kept saying, you corny. That's corny. Nigga, do it again. That, uh, that's corny. First of all, everybody was, you know, getting a little chuckle. He was trying to feel comfortable. He was like, shut up, shut up. And and, uh, and he just kept, you know, kept, kept doing it, kept doing it. But, you know, I was, well, I think I was like 21, and I didn't drive too much. And it was starting to get dark. I was in Torrance. I'm like, I got to get back down to Long Beach, you know, before it get dark. Right. And uh, I wasn't one of those kids that, like, started driving early and was just, all about town all those i didn't do all my all about town stuff until i was like older as far as driving so i had to get back down to long beach right but it was, it was a cool little thing he didn't he didn't finish while i was there though 
So it took him a lot. It took him a lot of takes because so he didn't he didn't make him do a line stop. Did do the next line and stop and punch it all in. He didn't make him do it like that, like he did Boys in the Hood. Yeah, he was doing it like that. Okay. But he kept stumbling. He kept stumbling over words. Ah. <laughs> not, not, not. You know that kind of stuff. Now, let me see. Now, Dre, Dre and Easy, you know, because, you know, they, they had their little beef or whatever, and a lot of people didn't get to see Dre and Easy like our generation did. The new generation just was like, oh, okay, they didn't like each other. They wanted to kill each other. When they were in, like, what were their relationship like, you know, before all the money came in and the beef? What was Dre and Easy's relationship like? Like brothers. Like, they were, like, I mean, it was real relaxed, and, you know, they were just kind of goofing on each other. I didn't feel any tension or anything as far as between them two. I, I kind of wish that they got a chance to, you know, mend, you know, mend that before Easy died and, you know, wish they would have did another N.W.A. album because that that right there would have been dope, man. So so tell us some more artists you know, more artists that you worked with, you know, and more producers, you know, you work with. Let's let, let's get a feel because I know you always, everybody want to know Tupac, okay? Everybody want to know about Me Against the World album, you know what I'm saying? And, and you more than that. So let us, you know, give us some more. Yes. Tell us, tell us, baby. Talk to us. We podcasting in this motherfucker 313 live show, baby. I, I would try to start from the beginning if I get off track. Uh, just bear with me, but I'm gonna try to name them kind of not not real fast, but kind of fast enough to get them out, and then we can discuss any one of them we want to discuss. No so problem. How about that? Let's do it, brother. All right. All right. So um, it started. Uh, Edwin Hawkins, gospel singer. Mm -hmm. I sang in the choir with him. Because of that, um, they they had done a song with Earth, Wind, and Fire called Touch the World. And they were going on tour. They wanted the Hawkins to be there, and they couldn't be at everything. So what they did was use the different chapters of the Edwin Hawkins Choir to sing on that song. So when they came to L.A. to the amphitheater, uh, I was driving my sister to go sing, and they needed alto. So I was in the background with Earth, Wind & Fire on that. And then subsequently after that, Philip Bailey was doing a solo album and some of us ended up singing background on that. Um, I was working with, simultaneously with that going on, I was working with Tisha Campbell. Um, she was signed to Capitol Records at the time, and we was doing some pop music. She was like 19, I believe. And, and then Tracy Spencer, a um, bunch of songs with her, but ended up... Um, getting cut off the album because they changed the style of it. Um, Joey Diggs, Troy Hinton, and then uh, I was being managed by, at this time I started being managed by uh, Norm Nixon, Storm and Norman, mm -hmm. and uh, he got me to do a spot on Different World. They needed uh, extras to, to be in Ron Johnson's band. I got to play guitar and be on an episode of that, and then got to be in House Party 2 in the dancing where they were doing Ralph Tresman and Tony, 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 and everybody had the pajamas on. Mm -hmm. um, got got to do that. At the same time, I had a song in this movie called Sea of Love, and then I started uh, doing stuff for Brandon Adams who was the little kid in Moonwalker in Michael Jackson's movie who was doing the, the, the little moonwalking thing. He had a deal through Angela Wimbush and Ron Isley through MCA. Mm -hmm. so I worked with Angela Wimbush and Ron Isley on his project, and uh, as well as my partners. We were all together. And then um, I think that's about the time I started working with radio and his project to work with uh, Wanda from The Emotion. And my sister and my cousin and Wanda were thinking about starting a new emotions at that time. We were talking about doing that because it sounded so good on that record. And then started working with Tupac and um, then I worked with Yo-Yo uh, on a Pan uh, Panther soundtrack, me and my sister. Mm -hmm. And so 
simultaneously I was doing Tales from the Hood soundtrack with uh, Spice One and my group NGN, and I played piano on the Wu Tang song on there. Okay. Um, and then, um, oh, then after that, I started uh, <clears throat> I started working with John Mellencamp, going on tour with him, and working on his records. And simultaneously, I started working with uh, Ron DeVoe from BBD. Okay. He wanted to do a solo album. And um, Miss Toy, the one that was on, you could do it, put your back into it. She was on this song with Ron DeVoe. And, like, I was her first producer on that. She had me and a producer before that, and we worked on this project. And I had written another song for Ron DeVoe called Booty Hunt. <laughs> BBD <laughs> that BBD wanted to use for their album so we were going to get them on it and in the midst of that all the other guys were like well we want to get on the song too so it ended up being for New Edition I go to the studio to work with them on their song Booty Hunt and have to play that for Babyface and Gerald Overt who's in there and I'm like this is my first time meeting them and I got to play them this corny song which which new edition is going it's going to be the first single off the album i'm like what wait a minute what and you know and i had them singing on it johnny gill oh you what's a booty <laughs> you know and all that stuff and it was bananas oh it was bananas and i'm still touring with Melancamp, and um and i had a song on sprung soundtrack that i had written for roger troutman to do and he ended up wanting too much money for it. So they took my demo and put it in the movie. Mm -hmm. And I, I hadn't had a chance to mix it or anything. And then some time went, I was still just with Mellencamp. I was trying to work on my own solo stuff and, and some of my artists. And um, I hadn't done anything with anybody. But then I hooked up with uh, Rex in Effect. Was it Rex in Effect? Yeah, Rex in Effect. Mm -hmm. Around 2002, I believe. Around the same time, I, I got with the Wallflowers and started playing with them and left the Mellencamp band. I hooked up with, uh, with, with uh, I think it's uh, School from uh, Rex and Effect and was doing some tracks and, you know, trying to come up with something, but nothing ever came of it. And see, dang it, now it made me remember something I forgot. Uh, for the Tales from the Hood soundtrack, I was working with uh, Big Daddy Kane, mm -hmm. and he got mad. He came to the studio and I didn't have no DJ equipment and stuff like that. He was used to working the East Coast way and I was on some West Coast stuff at the time. That's what they wanted. They wanted me to do a West Coast track with him doing East Coast rap and he wasn't feeling it. He left the studio. Oh, <laughs> dang. So, so anyway, flash forward, uh, about 03, I got let go from the wallflowers, so I got real mad, and I was like, I'm going to go back to California. I had moved from California and stayed in Indiana for years. And I was like, I'm going back to California, I'm going to try to hook up with Snoop, because I had saw him in New York, and he was trying to get the Doggy's Angels album, and it took so long for him to get on the song, because they was going to put it in Charlie's Angels movie, and... Um, they ended up not putting it in the movie and using Destiny's Child, and they blew up off of it. So they kept going with the Doggy's Angels thing and, and put the album out, but I'm not on it. Mm -hmm. But they gave me special thanks in the credit. Thank you, guys. And um, uh, little time goes on. I'm still just developing my artist. And then my manager, who said, hey, man, Dr. Freeze, man, I manage him too. We we had to hook you guys up and do some projects together. And he did, you know, Poison, and he did, you know, Thought It Was Me and Do Me Baby and mm -hmm. Sex You Up and Break It Down for Michael Jackson. So I'm like, okay, cool. And we started working together on some songs to try to get a deal with Ruthless Records and almost got signed. This was about 08. We almost got signed with Ruthless. Um, but something happened where we we ended up not doing it or just did delayed or whatever and my manager hooked us up to do uh, some projects with Ralph Trezvan so we started doing some stuff with him and in the midst of that Michael wanted Freeze to come work with him and he was like man you ought to get Mosey to come 
and they took me to Vegas. I had a meeting with Michael, and you know he loved me, and you know we chatted it up, and ended up being part of his production team. And then a year later, he passed away. I'm like, mm. wow. so I finally moved to California, <laughs> and I finally moved to California. And then I meet up with my homie Shalif, who did half his cover, <clears throat> <clears throat> and he goes, Hey man, uh. Half Dead wanted to hook up with you, man. I you up and stuff. You know, I've been doing some tracks for him for his Raiders thing. And he was like, man, uh, Half Dead wanted to hook up with you. I'm like, all right, cool. So me and Half hooked up and, you know, talked about old times and and just started, like, vibing together. And he was like, man, we ought to do a record together. And, and then a year later, we actually started doing it. And it ended up being the Dead Serious album. And he was telling me he was gonna hook me up with a uh, heavy D to work on some stuff. And then right when he said that, heavy D passed away. Wow. And uh, I was just feeling like, man, I'm jinx in, in, in the industry. <laughs> nah. Not really, you know, because I don't wholeheartedly feel that way. Nah. It just was like a fleeting thought, you know, Tupac passed, Roger Chalmers passed, Michael passed, or, you know, Prince passed. Oh, uh, see, and that made me forget. I did a, a remix for for Prince that he did a song for Kevin Campbell. Yeah. Called Halls of Desire. Halls of Desire. I did a remix for that in in '93. No. Uh, no. I'm sure there's some stuff I forgot. No, hold on, hold on. I gotta ask you. You worked with Prince. What was it like in the studio working with Prince? Or was he there? I, he wasn't there. Okay. He wasn't there. I got to meet him at the Roxbury. Um, you know, the club out here and just chop it up with him for a sec. But um, when that happened, it was through my publisher who actually was uh, hired to do the remix. And and I came in and helped him with his remix and did a whole new remix of my own, like just to do a flip version of it. And, uh, you know, so they had multiple versions of it. Okay. Nah. So that's how I got in on it because my publisher actually, who I hooked up with in '99, uh, uh, no, not '99, in '89, I hooked up with him, and he got me into so many different things, just you know, trying to create the songs. He got me with with Mellencamp because Mellencamp was looking for Dr. Dre, and he, you know, he basically told him, "Now you need to hook, hook up with Mosey because you know he he writes songs and he." He plays instruments, he understands rock and, you know, that kind of stuff. He got me in all the movie soundtracks, the Rusty, Condies, and, yeah. Wow. Very instrumental. Most definitely. Now, because I'm going back and I'm going to ask about <clears throat> Ryan Isley. How was it working with Ryan yeah. Isley, man? What was it like working with that oh, dude? Oh, man. Very cool, because he was real laid back, but very, very sure of what he was saying like you can tell when in his mood of just you know goofing off or just having fun or you know making little comments or you could tell when he was very serious about the input he was about to tell you like you could look on his face he just he looked like now look here mosey now i think that right there you it, this should be that you know and i was listening intently and Angela Wimbush was the same way. They were very, I guess, personable, like to the the, the, the artist that they, they trying to get the point across to. Mm -hmm. It was a very different environment than like Dr. Dre was like, nigga, do this, uh, you know, do that. And with them, it was more of, hey, what if you tried this? It, you know, the approach was different, and and it I think that kind of uh, shaped how I produced too because they were like that. Okay. Now, Michael, what was what was he like? Was he a gentle guy, or was he behind closed doors uh, a mean motherfucker? Michael was very mysterious. I can't I can't really talk too much about it in the press because okay. I signed this confidentially thing. Okay. <laughs> but well, we won't we won't touch that. We gonna strike that. We ain't gonna touch it. Well, I mean, I could touch on it a little bit. Okay. He was very very down to earth. Very down to earth and. And very real, like you know, he he didn't use the high voice with me. He he spoke in the same voice I'm speaking in. Basically, he sounded like like me. He was very just cool. He you know all love, and we 
discuss music and life and my kids and you know it was a beautiful thing that's beautiful now now, now my boys new edition <laughs> what was it like fucking with all them was bobby in the picture or just the uh, just the uh, regular bobby fu- and they were, all, they were all supposed to be a part of it bobby didn't come and, and mike did not come either Mm-hmm. But everybody else was there. Johnny, Ricky, uh, Ralph, Ronnie. Yeah, that was it. That was it. So how was it with them guys? What was it like fucking with them? It, it was very cool. They, 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 you know, very professional. They, they uh, took, you know, uh, not criticism, but they took direction as far as, like, building the song and all that. They, they really listened, and they, they were real professional. It, but it was a, what, what got me about that session was walking in the door because you know I'm used to going into sessions and people are like oh yeah Mosey's here let's go 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 you know and getting things straight and you know and I'm, I got free reign and that kind of thing but in that session even though I'm the producer they were like you know I couldn't go right in I had to like you sit here and we're gonna come get you when it's I'm like Dang. you know but I go in the door. And who opens up the door for me is Babyface's brother, Kevon. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this is like uh, a dude from Apple 7. And I go in, I open the, I say, thanks, man. And I go in and open the door, and I hear the piano playing, and I hear the guys they're singing. I look over, I see Gerald O'Vert kneeling down by the piano, Babyface playing the piano, and them guys standing around the piano singing. I'm like, oh, wow. You know how, how many people would pay to be in this situation right now? And you in there. I'm just right here. I'm in there with them, and they look at, hey, how's it going? You know, and then we go in the booth, and and they're like, you know, going on and on about this song. And David Chase is like, man, I really want to hear this song. And I'm going, my, my stomach is nervous because David Chase is like one of my favorite writers and singers. And I'm just like, and Gerald LaVert, the same thing. I'm just like, mm. and I'm knowing this song has the phrase in it on the second verse when it comes in it Ryan, Ryan is rapping he goes I like to make the vaginal injury from the back <laughs> relax the booty and make it shine like it's wet and pass it to Johnny Bobby Ricky and Mike and Riz where's the booty fellas and they go ooh there it is I'm like I know that that part is coming and I'm just like oh my god this is gonna be embarrassing do you know they was rolling on the floor <laughs> Gerald, I mean, all of them, all of them, really. But Gerald and Babyface, they had never heard anything like that in their entire life. They hit this really East Coast beat and like the the domino kind of sing rap kind of thing over in, in parts and in parts, you know, rapping. But you're just saying this outlandish stuff that you wouldn't expect new addition to be saying. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That that's that's dope right there, man. That that like I said, man, this is what podcast is about, man. Letting you open up. We ain't, you know, stopping you from saying what you want to say, man. And and the audience, they love it, man. They appreciate it because they like, wow, we never heard this before. You know, we never right. experienced that, and you know, and you comfortable, you ain't on no well, you can't say this, you can you can only say this shit. You you know, you being yourself, like I say, but you you got some yeah, good shit. They get to see the reality of they get to see the reality reality of what goes on. Because people think they think that things are different than they really are. And that's how they get you. That's how the industry gets you. They want you to come in thinking, Yeah, I'm just gonna think I'm a superstar. I'm just gonna go all about it and just do what I gotta do. And got I got people handling my stuff. Mm-hmm. But I learned firsthand if you don't handle your stuff with your people and be hands on and and know what's coming in and what's coming out and what this mean and what does that and what does that do and what are other people doing? Mean? Like know your business. If you don't know that, you will get screwed. You are not above anything. I tried to tell Tupac this. Right. This is a conversation me and Tupac was having when he was telling me how how much he loved Dre and he wanted to be a part of Death Row and, and uh, Snoop and all those guys he, he wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, bro, I said, you know, Dre is my favorite producer as well. I'll never take nothing away from him. But Dre also told me how they do business at Ruthless Records. I'm pretty sure it's not too too much different in this 
you know, in this instance, you know, they're going to get you in a position where you need them for money. They're going to provide you with bits of money here and there, and even a car, a house. It won't be in your name, but you'll be able to stay there as long as everything is cool. And then when things go south, they're going to kick you out of it. And he didn't believe me. He was like, man, I'm too black, man. You know, I already took my car. I walked right across the street as soon as I came out of the office and bought another one cash. And <laughs> so I walked this street. And I was like, okay, okay, I get that. But if you're in a position where you don't have your own money and they got you like that, then things are going to be different. What ended up happening? They were holding his money. And so, yeah, he may have been getting some money here and there and, there and, and slow to this and that. But... You know, there were things that, you know, that wasn't his, that they were in other people's names because he didn't have the money to do it. They provided it for him. That's just how it goes. Dre was going at the, the, the people on Aftermath, you know. You see, like, when Game had got into it with 50. Mm-hmm. How, did, how did you come in somebody's house and take their stuff and, and or kick them out or whatever unless it's not in their name, Right. Right. So what? So you telling me that? It, well, I'm just asking. I'm not saying you telling me. Did that happen between Dre and Game, where they went in and put Game out of his place or something? So my, I, I heard a rap that that Game was saying and was talking about how things went uh, when uh, I think it, had, it was his comeback album after the, the whole thing was fifty or whatever, and he was saying something about how. Uh, yeah, they came up in my house, and they, and, you know, I can't remember word for word. It was something to that nature where they had, you know, when things went wrong, and you know, Dre had to choose sides or whatever. He, you know, he kind of felt like he chose fifty or whatever. Dre was just kind of pulling back, like, you know, hey, you know, I'm tired, you know, <laughs> they ain't gonna get shit yet, you know. Right. Um, but I think it was something. To that fact, I don't know who came up in his house and said what. I don't know if it was Dre or if it was 50 or I don't know. But I, I think he was alluding to something to that effect. But that's, that kind of stuff goes on all the time. And it's wow. not just the black artists, you know, it's white artists that go to this, and Spanish artists. It's the nature of how they have the industry set up. When they blowing you up, mm-hmm. they blowing you up, but they also providing the money to blow you up up front and you got to pay that back and you Thanks. thinking oh i'm just blowing up and you building up a, a whole array of of uh bills that you got to pay as well right now let me ask you this now from your knowledge after tupac passed away what did was taken back from Tupac that you know of that he thought may have thought was his and the family may have thought was his and it wasn't that you may know of I don't know of anything specifically. Oh, okay. Well, we 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 ain't gonna touch I that. Just, but I do, I do know that they were they were, you know, holding out on this money. And I don't know if it was in a documentary or something because I try to watch a lot of that stuff to try to piece all the puzzles together. But uh, something was said to the fact that that uh, something wasn't his. Mo, I'm gonna ask you this dumbass question. I know it's dumb, and I'm. Kind of embarrassed to ask this. To ask, yeah, to ask you this question because you know a lot of people, you know, ask this shit. I I know that he's and I know that he's dead. I believe he's dead after speaking with certain family members. I know that he's dead, but is Tupac dead? <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, Tupac is dead. Uh, I believe. That, I believe this. You know how he had the seven seven year thing, you know, where he was gonna the Machiavelli thing. Yeah. And he was gonna come back. Okay, I think if he was gonna do that, he would have done it because this is like you know this is twenty years later. Mm-hmm. And for anyone to try to be in obscurity for that long, when especially everybody's looking for you, like Elvis and you know that kind of stuff, like when Elvis passed and everybody was like, oh, he's I see Elvis here and I see Elvis there. Um, he's one of those recognizable people that there are a lot of people who look like him. Mm-hmm. You know, my my dude in, in the movie who, who played him, his dad, you know, he used to produce Tupac. He did Tossed It Up. And even Pac was telling him back in the day, 
and she looked just like me. <laughs> so there, and I knew a dude in Indiana who looked like Pac with green eyes, and they they call him they call him Pac. You know, that was like his name when he was in college. And there's people around who look like each other. Yes, that- but I think we know Tupac with the kind of energy that he had or had. Mm-hmm. He would not have held his peace this long. Not at all. He did get found found out there. You know, he still got those legal issues that was hanging over his head, but it probably coming to effect, and he know that. So. Well, well, technically the the st- no, technically the statute of limitation is up on the on the yeah the statute been up what fifteen years is fifteen years for the um, one he went to jail for. So basically, in, in in Vegas, there is no crime to fake your death. So he wouldn't have been charged in Vegas. But the sexual limitation on that sexual shit it wasn't sexual assault. I, f- I forgot what it was called. But the sexual limitation was up on that. It was I want to say twelve to fifteen years. That was the sexual well, limitation. Convicted though. Yeah, it does matter. But the sexual limitation is up on that. And he he would came out went you know they would have arrested him and they would have let him go. He wouldn't have went to prison. And then, you know, who Tupac is, he was on the appeal. So uh, any mo- any lawyer, good money, with the money Tupac estate have, if he was alive, and he came out and said, hey, I want to turn myself in, I want to fight this, they're not going to lock him up. They're going to give him a bond, a new bond, and go on about your business, and you're going to go to trial and, you know, for the appeal, and nine times out of ten... They would have figured out a whole different way to get him because they already had been trying to figure out ways to get him. Mm-hmm. And even with the best lawyers, because even O.J. had the best lawyers that got him off the original case, he still had to spend years on different things, but mm-hmm. still, really, they was trying to make him pay for that. Right, but you, you gotta look at it like this. They can't compare the apples to the oranges. The white motherfuckers wanted OJ because he got away with killing a, a nigga, killing two lily white people. Tupac just was in a room where a, a female, black female, just allegedly got raped. <laughs> you feel me? With with a bunch of niggas in the room, so they really didn't give a fuck about her. Yeah, but he was still coming off of being a, co- a cop shooter. Remember? Yeah, he was. St- yeah, and that was. They, they still would have considered him dangerous like that, like he evaded. Like they, you know how how they do? They be like, uh, he he he, he take this death to evade this, and he and so we have to throw this new charge on him. It, you know what I mean? They they figure out something. Most definitely. Figure out something. Not, not in the country without a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 let's let, let's just clear up because it's some some it's a couple motherfuckers like uh certain motherfuckers who need medication that will say wait a minute listen to this what mo mo what mo is saying mo is saying this and mo is saying that mo is right. giving us clues that Tupac is still alive so you want to you want to you want to clear that up brother. I am giving you- I am not giving y'all no type of clues. I am not saying that he is alive. I am just making jest of how silly the notion is that he faked his death all this time and at some point is still going to come back and make everybody happy. You know? <laughs> Facts. It's nah. not, not going to happen, guys. Uh, I mean, you know, I know, I know some of his family. I know... You know, the artists that he rocked with and, you know, and most of her family as well. Uh, if he was around, he would have absolutely contacted. Those people were his life, right? That was his people, you know? And, and the that's, ki- a, that's the thing about... I'm sorry, man. I, I had to go back to this, this go. that album cover. That album cover with, with Little Half Dead. Right. right. Oh, yeah, because I was going to hit you with that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's do it. Yeah. The, the 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 notion that that my dude should leave was making it that that he that half dead killed Yak and Tupac and it was all in the studio and the Can Am and all that stuff. Okay, let me explain it this way. Um, my dude should leave made this. He saw in a magazine this Can Am studio and didn't. He didn't even know until years later that that's the studio that Pockenham was recording in. I had to tell him that. Because mm-hmm. I didn't know from the animation that he had made it from 
that picture. Mm-hmm. So I saw the thing, and he was like, yeah, it's like his face come in. He's like, I'm dead serious, and, and his music is so serious that, you know, all the stuff that's being in the studio, and they just passed out. They just, you know, they just they can't even take it. They just, they just out of here. And I look at it, I'm like, oh, okay. Now, to look at the picture, to look at the, the faces of who those people are in their pics, and they're trying to say that that's Yak and Pac. Right. Now, Yak did not have a beard. Not at all. Tupac had a goatee. Mm-hmm. And in that picture, that one guy that's supposed to be Pac in everybody's eyes, he don't have no goatee. The other guy, he got dreads and a beard. Mm-hmm. And a goatee. Now, that wasn't even a yacht look. Now, Yacht and Pac were like brothers to me and my sister. Mm-hmm. When my sister, when my sister was out my my her and her and my dad got into it and she was out on the street. She stayed with them because they felt like, oh no, you family, you gonna stay with us, sis, you gonna, you know, and hung with them for a while and was being with them and you know I would see them when we go to the studio because that was you know that's where we was on. We wasn't on no hanging out, partying and doing all that stuff. And mm-hmm. when that was happening, y'all would come to our little events and stuff with us. You know, riding my in the back seat, and, you know, he goes places with us, and you know, all kind of stuff. They was like brothers to us. I would not have let Shalif make a picture killing those two and 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 more uh, immortalizing it to be like something that satire with little half dead being the one taking them out in any kind of way, whether it's musically, whether whether it's physically or any kind of way, because I love my brother half dead. Mm-hmm. We grew up together and all that. But I also love my brother Yacht, and I love my brother Pop. There's no way I would let anything like that happen. I would not let him come up with something like that. And then to top it off, when little half dead saw the cover, he didn't even like it. Okay. He was like, eh, I don't, I don't like it. And Shalif kept pushing because people kept going, oh, man, that's dope, that's dope, that's dope. We kept pushing it. And, you know, they were like best friends. You know, they he'd come over there all the time. they blaze up. They had a song together. He got a song on the album with, with you know, with Half Dead uh, uh, called Every Day. And they were shooting little videos together and stuff. And, you know, there was no mention of any connection with Tupac with that album cover. Most so I just want to clear that up for people that that Shalif didn't have no intent like that. I didn't have no intent like that. Half Dead did not order nothing like that. He didn't even like the cover. He just let it go because people was just saying they dug it, and he I guess he eventually grew into it. True. Okay. Yeah. Now, now let me say this. Like I said, I said it early on. You know, Jesse's a good dude. Uh, you know, RJ yeah, Bond is absolutely. a good guy. So, like, is there anything that you would, you know, because Jesse's listening. He's listening to this shit because he's, he's soaking it up. He's listening. Is there right, I- right. anything that, you know, you would, would want to say to Jesse and RJ for even putting that theory out there about Lil Half Dad having something to do with Tupac's well, death? You know, I look at it like this with, 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 with uh, Jay. It's journalism. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. He's he's taking something that somebody said, and he's putting it, he's he's reporting it. I get it. Uh, at a certain point, you know, when you learn different facts from different people, and you start putting stuff together, and, and then when these people are saying these theories and, and commenting, you should be able to to combat what they're saying with the new information that you're given, especially, you know, because I know Jesse, he he doesn't believe this theory about Little Half Dead and mm-hmm. Tupac. Okay, now, so, now he, did he tell you he didn't believe it, or you, you assume it? He told, me, he told me that he don't believe it. He told me that he's tried to tell different people that, this, that the theory makes no sense. Okay. So I said to him, what you have to do is you have to come back what they're saying with the information that you're given now, like you know, and, and he said, I, and that's when he that he did. He, he went the same guy who interviewed Half did interviewed him, 
for the A&E special. But they cut him out because he wasn't going with the whole, he wasn't going with, well, you know, from what he was saying, they wasn't going, he wasn't going with the whole half dead killing in theory. So they cut him out. I, mm-hmm. You know, I don't know that 100% and it could be true. Right. But uh, uh, I don't have no beef with Jesse. My, my beef was with the person who brought up this theory, and, and I, I think he brought up this theory in, like, 98. Like, had that been dealing with this since, like, 98 on this guy? And then there's these people who believe this theory, and they're showing, like, video footage of, like, the dog pound on stage with Tupac, and they're, like, commenting, they're saying, like, uh, right here uh, have that looks like this and now Tupac his expression changed and he's doing this and I'm going where's half that <laughs> in his video and he wasn't even I there don't have that. I don't see half that I see Tupac he keep laughing in the back and then he comes around and everything's in slow motion he, his, his facial expression does change he comes around he goes around here but who I see on stage is Daz Corrupt Snoop uh, my homie B Tip. Uh, I see some other cats. I don't see Half Dead in this clip that they're talking. About. Oh, I see Warren G. I'm not even looking at the clip, but right? visually what I have seen, and I'm going, okay, where is Half Dead? That they're talking about Half Dead came and he's looking menacing now, and now Tupac he changes expression and he goes, I'm going, this is utter bull. Man. These guys are on stage rapping together. Man, they have had several instances where they're together and they're having fun. You know, it's crazy. People want you to believe. Like I say, some people, they love being lied to. They just like being lied to. So, you know, it's yeah. it, it, it's just, it's crazy, man. Now, let me ask you, let me ask you a question. Because you, you, I, I noticed you're getting off into the YouTube thing and watching the YouTube videos because you're talking about the comments. How do you feel when you click on a video of somebody saying Tupac faked his death or Tupac is over in Africa or Tupac was saw here and there and just all that fuck shit about Tupac faked his death? I mean, how does that make you feel or just just the thought of it when you read this shit or you even hear these clowns talking crazy? It, it makes me feel like either, either they're the kind of person who is, you know, and there are people who are so gullible and, and hopeful and, you know, they love Pac so much that they just want, you know, with all of their might to, you know, for him to have faked his death and they really honestly believe it and, you know, honestly there's something a little left centered with, with those type of people because there's no support to what you're saying. You, you have all these weird theories and there's no support. And then time goes on and then nothing happens. You know, people were saying by the time uh, 2011 come, he's gonna come back. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Jesus. <laughs> this is my thing. And in the um, audience, they are the blame. They are at fault. And when I say the audience is to blame and is at fault because they listen to these guys and some of these guys have been called out and proven to be liars. And the audience don't hold these guys accountable for the shit that they said or for the flip-flopping or none of that. The audience don't hold them accountable. So when, you're, when your audience don't hold you accountable, then the, the YouTuber or the podcaster may say, well, hey, these dumb motherfuckers is buying this shit. So I'm going to keep on doing it and they're going to keep on watching it or they're going to keep on listening to it. So, you know, yeah, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, it's a it's, it's vicious. Ones, they, they want to capitalize on that. Most definitely. And the, and the best way to shut their money down and to kill their money is quit listening to the bullshit. Quit watching the bullshit. You know, that's that's just how I feel about it. Like any. Anybody that, okay, I'm not going to touch down on anything without even knowing about it. If I speak on it, 
I spoke to a source, a, a, a good source, an actual source to it, or I'm going to bring that source onto my show and we're going to talk about it and I'm going to ask the questions direct like I'm asking you and then it goes out there and then bam okay well this is in this person's words not chopped up as as how I want it to be I'm giving it to you in this person's exact words so you know it gets no better than that when you got facts and you got proof and you got the people who were there right it's just hard when the, when the people who were there tell their story and then there's, there's people that still don't believe it you know, it's like mm-hmm. what? Like I just did an interview for for Jesse, and there were people on YouTube, and they were like giving me the business. They're like, "Oh, he sure look like he's nervous. <laughs> like, he's all sweaty and nervous." And I'm like, "What?" And really, I apologize to those ones I went off on because that was unprofessional. But no, it no, just drove me bananas. Don't don't, ap- don't apologize, brother, because like I said, these are young teenagers who live overseas who don't know our don't know our culture don't know what's going on were not even born when Tupac was 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 murdered was not even born when Tupac was doing his thing these are kids man so these kids have to be the same kids that be like telling me uh they want to move to Long Beach and and I'm like well why Cause there's that, a lot of gang activity, and like, yeah, that's what. That's why I want to get. I'm like, you, you thinking that it's like some happy, happy, you know, we in the gang, we're gonna have, have picnics, and like, you thinking that's what it is? You wow. don't you know, have any idea of different cultures, so you know how you look at them, the uh, the movies where they they praise the the bad guy, the bad guy gets all the glory and stuff. Yeah, that's like what they're doing. But not, that's all. Like I say, they they not from America, so they don't they don't know the culture. They want to be a part of that culture, so they they feel that okay. I want to go over here. Snoop was in Long Beach. I want to go hang out in Long Beach and and hang out with the with the Crips or or Pac was hanging with the Bloods. I want to go move to Compton and and hang out with the Pyrus and and just all this fuck shit, man. Right. You, you, once you once you read the comments. You really get to looking like, wow, these are some stupid motherfuckers, you know. And the killing part is what I, I lo- what I love personally about a hater, right? That gets on your shit. They watch your shit. They come on your shit, watch your shit all the way through, then leave a fucking comment to uh, of some hate to let you know that they hate you. That's that's the big. I love that. Because that means that mm-hmm. I got that much power over your dumb ass that you sat here and you watch my shit and then you come and say some hateful shit. That's power. Mm-hmm. Or when you stop doing what you're doing to say uh, fuck three one three live show. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That that's power. That's power. That's power. <laughs> power. <laughs> that's what they take it. Yeah, it's power. Yeah, it's power, man. It's like okay, like somebody come to call and you a liar. They sit there and watch you do your thing and, and kick it and telling them the motherfucking truth, but they gonna call you a motherfucking liar and say, "Oh, look at him, he look nervous right there." <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. That's crazy, man. Now, now I gotta ask you this, right, before I, we wrap it up, because we did a, a beautiful interview, man, and and the, the audience is gonna love this. The family they gonna love it. Give us a Tupac story. Like I always ask anybody who interacted with Tupac, give us something like just a, a, a personal moment, a private moment with the, about Tupac that no cameras, no media, no nothing was around. Nobody know, but only you and the people who were in that room at that time. Okay. Okay. Well, I think one of the funniest moments for me and it was like, I don't know, it was funny, but I opened it at the same time. But we were at a quad studio doing Outlaw, mm-hmm. and we were taking a break. And he had got, uh, he had bought McDonald's for everybody. And it was like, there's McDonald's everywhere. And so we had the box playing. Remember that, that uh, video showed all the box where they like, had a, these songs playing on there all the time? Oh, yeah, the video, yeah, video jukebox, yeah. Yeah, so we had that playing, and uh, my, the song that I did on, uh, 
uh, Fear of a Black Hat uh, with Rusty Cundy. It was, uh, uh, great like movie. Froggy Frog. Great movie. I like that. You know that, you know that Ice Froggy Frog. Yeah. Where we like did a parody of yeah Snoop and him. Mm-hmm. So that comes up the box, and I started laughing. And he was like, "What?" I said, um, "Man, that I, I did that song right there. I produced that. That's me and my sister." And, and I started laughing a second, and he listened to us for about 30 seconds, and he goes, don't ever tell anybody else that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, yeah. yeah, that was, that was a good one. Yeah. That was a good one. See, that, like, moments like that, man, this is shit that, you know, per, like, private moments, you know what I'm saying? These are the the priceless moments right here that, you know, you're sharing with, with the family over here, the 313 Live Show family, man. And, and they, they love that. They appreciate that, man. Um, yo, yo, Can I talk about Morris Day for a sec? Oh, please, please. That's my man's. Cause I, I forgot all about that, man. Because uh, last year, um, I got a call from Snoop and Lil' Half Day, and they was, they was both on three-way, and they was like, hey, man, uh, want you to try to do this song for uh, Morris Day. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. And I had noticed like a few days before that, it was a picture of Snoop and Morris on Facebook saying they was collaborating together. So I'm like, oh, maybe they're trying to get me on that record, you know? So he said, I want you to like write a song for him. Like do do a, do a track and like write a song and like as soon as you can. So I'm like, all right. And I already had a track that was popping there was on that vibe and I'm like oh so I wrote to it sent it to him and Snoop said Morris love it and I'm like you sent it to Morris like oh snap he said yeah he, uh, do three more I'm like okay so just go by send him three more he's like dang that was fast and I'm like I was pumped up pumped up he's like okay uh, try to try to do 10 just see if you can do 10 and I'm like Oh, so I'm like working and doing it. I get to about six, and Prince passed away. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh man, this is messed up. And I'm just like bugging out because, like, you know, I'm knowing that Prince had did all of Morris's music before. I'm trying to channel him, and now he passes away. And I'm like, now I gotta really try to channel him, you know, like try to take his the spirit that he might have left here while he going up, you know, and I'm using it for Morris. Mm-hmm. And uh and I wrote this song called uh Over That Rainbow and it was like a dedication song to Prince. And um so Morris heard it and he didn't want to do it cuz he was just like, you know, I'm known for doing like the cool song, you know, this right here made me feel emotional. And mm-hmm. after, you know, listening to it more and more, he was like, I'm, you know what? I'm I'm going to try it. And then we ended up going to the studio and working and we went to Snoop's studio and was recording in there and did his album there and he recorded this song man it had us all in tears man we tried all trying to be cool and, by the, and we held it all to the end of the song until he said rest in peace my brother and all of a sudden we just like <laughs> you know and uh, <laughs> and they shot a video to it so the that as a, a little soft single uh, a year ago, uh, like January, mm-hmm. and they got a video to it. It's called Over That Rainbow. The rest of the album, I guess they're, they're trying to work it out to bring it out, and uh, you might see me playing with him, too. I might be on stage with Morris and guys, yes. Okay. Now, now, know. Morris a cool motherfucker. Now, hey, d- tell us something about Morris. Now, did, I know Snoop is a, a chronic weed smoker. Was was Morris in there hitting that chronic? No, nah, he wasn't. Uh, Morris wouldn't. He wouldn't. Do, he, he just wanted to do his vodka cranberry. Vodka. Okay. He uh, he he uh, pull about you know almost to the top of uh, vodka and then put a splash of cranberry in there for color. <laughs> Hell That's no. the way he explained it. That's the way he explained it. He put a little splash in there just for color. <laughs> <laughs> so Morris a cool motherfucker. Yeah, he got smoked out. He had to keep. Uh, well, ma- mainly his manager had to keep going to the other room. But Morris was cool. He was just 
you know, just sitting there wiggling his foot. I like this, you know, and, and singing. And oh, he was really good to work with too. He took direction very good. He was more of the kind of person that he didn't want to deviate from the demo. Like if I made the demo, he wanted to sing it just like the demo. He wanted to do all the stuff I did in there if, if it wasn't too high. Cause I forgot that it's 30 years later and he don't sing that high anymore. Right. You know, that was all goes up there. But he took direction well, and um, you know, it was dope. That's what and I'm talking about. This even got Snoop on there rapping on it. Hey, that's what I'm talking about. Yo, Mo, man, hey, we appreciate you, man, for um, even taking the time out your busy schedule, man, to sit down and, you know, give us this interview, man. I, I felt it. Absolutely. I, I, I rexed out to you. We had to do this, man, because, you know, I had to clear some things up, clear the air, and, you know, get your, your true pin, opinion and feelings on everything, you know what I'm saying? And the best way to do that is right here on the 313 Live show, man. Um, do you want to shout anybody out or you want to say anything before we wrap this, my brother? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I definitely want to uh, say be on the lookout for my, my R&B album called Soul Finger. Mm -hmm. Coming out, it's going to be on the Funk House International Records label, my own. And I have many, 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 many artists that I'm going to be dropping uh coming from the label, Benny Kid, Hollywood S, uh, Money Wells, uh, oh gosh, uh, it's so many, it's like 40 artists, man, I'm gonna forget somebody, but, uh, um, Lulu Bison, uh, Brian Smoot and Summit Band, uh, uh, you know, Country, uh, you know, Jamie, uh, Jamie Nicole, you know, uh, Rock, alternative rock, uh, Rich Hardesty. I mean, I got a whole list of different styles and different ages. My kids even got records going to come out on Funk House. And uh, just be on the lookout for that, uh, as well as new production. I'm getting myself geared up to do uh, some, some new major productions and stuff, as well as dipping into acting. Hey, that's what's up, my brother. Hey, let, let me ask you one more question before I let you go. If the if the estate and the family, you know, reached out to you and said, yo, Mo, we, we got some of these unreleased Tupac tracks over here, man. We want you to work with some of them, produce some of them. Would you jump on board with that? Absolutely, without question. Hey, right, man. Super fast. And I think we need that, man. I, we, I don't think we really do need that. So I hope that the family consider that because, you know, hey, your production skills, my brother, is on point. And shit, your tracks Thank was you. some of the best motherfucking tracks on that album. And that's real talk. Thank you, man. Thank you. I'm proud to say that he told me I was his favorite producer. He had a lot of really good producers. And for him to say that to me was just like, oh, my gosh, for real? But... Yeah. I think, you know, I'm one of the ones that really care about what's going to happen, what's, what's, you know, between the, the communication with the vocals and the mix and, you know, and the sonics and the energy and all of that stuff, and I really care about it. I think that it would be a good thing for me to do that record because I would just take his words and I would give it so much coloration with music that you would feel like it's a movie, you know what I mean? Man, we need I'm dying that. To do that. We need that. We need that for real, brother. I'm dying to do, but I want the proper, I want the proper vocals out because I have did a couple of mixtapes with with his vocals and stuff. But just the circumstance of it, uh, you know, not having a clear vocal or got other stuff jumping in and out, you know, not being able to choose. I, I will, if I had the proper vocals and and, and separation and all that stuff, I, I'd be able to do it. That's what's up, my brother. Yo, thank you again, my brother, and we appreciate you. And man, we gotta have whenever you want to come back, man. You family on the three one three live show, man. You got my number. I got your number, man. You know whatever you need me to do for you, it's done. You ain't even gotta you know ask. It's done. Just let me know. So, thank you, man. I absolutely will. I really appreciate you too. Now, oh man, honestly. it's all love, my brother. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was our homie. Mo Z M D. We thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the show. Peace.